I want to go ahead and introduce. Oh, perfect timing. The recording just started. <laughs> well, bam, recorded. <laughs> so, um, welcome, Dan. This is uh, the um, speaker series for Virginia Series Game Institute, the VSGI, and we um, have several of them. We'll post the link in the chat in a moment. But um, Dan is our speaker for today, and he works at Filament Games. He's the CCO, and I'll read his bio really quickly from the site. He's a founding partner of Filament Games and leads their game design practice. He has designed games on a broad range of topics, ranging from marine turtle ecology to legal argumentation. In his tenure at Filament Games, Dan has overseen the development of more than 200 games for both schools and consumers. And of course, I'll let Dan introduce himself as well. Um, and then I'll come back in at the end to kind of moderate the Q&A and I will, uh, and I will, uh, can't remember what else I was gonna do at the end. Oh yeah, I'll bring you back to the, like the, the next speakers that are coming to the speaker series, just to kind of highlight what's coming in the future. So thanks again, Dan, for being here. I'm going to turn my mic off. All right, cool. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna hit the share button and then share a screen. I, I wanna make sure it's the right screen so you don't just get a cascade of my face or whatever. Uh, so did that work? Are you seeing what looks like slides? Yes, we've got it. We can see it. Okay. All we're right, not so. seeing it in the slide view. Now there we're we go. Perfect. Yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, yeah, basically, uh, hi everybody. Yeah, Jacob. Jacob told all truthful things there at the beginning about me. I'm uh, I've been making learning games now for uh, the the current sort of sales pitch tells me 17 years, which sounds insane to me. Uh, but yeah, we've been making made a ton of different games. We've been in the positive impact field or learning game field for the entire time. And uh, I'm happy to be a resource and talk about the field writ large in any way at the end of this talk. But my main focus today is just sort of highlight some of the stuff that makes the serious games field weird and different when compared to entertainment games. Um, so the obvious disclaimer out front is like, I don't actually have a amazing personal experience compare and contrast here. I've been working in positive impact games the entire time. So I don't have grizzled veteran anecdotes about the entertainment side of things. I really just have what, from what I understand of entertainment game development contrasted with my personal experience in serious games. So most of my points are gonna be all driven around like what are things that make what we do unique in our field and less about uh, what's really unique and specific about the entertainment field. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I think I got, yeah, I think something like not a lot of slides. So it's gonna be, you know, a, a couple, well, more than a couple points, but you know, hopefully afterwards I could just be a resource and people can ask what they think about the field and how it works. Um, so, uh, the main giant huge difference between our two fields is what is what sort of becomes like the lodestone for development uh, when you're making a game, right? So an entertainment game, in some ways you could say has the luxury, but in some ways you could say has necessity that it's pivoting around engagement uh, no matter what. Uh, so... I'm not trying to pick on Candy Crush here in any kind of negative way. It's just that Candy Crush is a game that's been painstakingly streamlined and smoothed and polished and uh, to be as feel good of an experience as possible. You know, uh, I think maybe a, a, when when Candy Crush was made, someone probably thought candy was a really cool visual thing, but if user testing had suggested that, you know, monsters would have been better than candy, then, you know, they could have happily moved away from candy and be like, we can crush anything in this game. Because really it's about the experience, the fun, the scaffolding and the engagement and the stickiness of the experience rather than anything else. Um, so I think that in some ways that can be an anchor that's difficult to navigate for games uh, in, in entertainment. Uh, I had a friend who worked uh, a long time ago on an Incredible Hulk game, 
uh, and it was in the entertainment arena. And uh, the publisher came back to them and said, hey, uh, we did some uh, user testing out there and the kids, the kids, they want stealth in their game. So you have to add stealth to your game. And, you know, the team was like, we're making an incredible Hulk game. Uh, <laughs> you throw cars. Uh, this is not a stealth scenario. But the publisher was like, well, figure it out. Uh, and they did figure it out. You know, you had uh, Dr. Banner had to like escape out of a lab, you know, so they did successfully integrate stealth into the game, but really nothing, nothing ultimately matters past uh, making sure that the game is fun and is super engaging. And you have a lot of freedom in some sense to be able to pivot. You can throw out big hunks of what may have been considered core design uh, to get back and find and explore and, and, you know, maximize engagement. Um, and obviously serious games also care about engagement, but you, we have a different lodestone. We actually have the mission statement for what is the, what is the impact you want your game to have? Um, oh, actually, you know what? Let me do a quick caveat about I keep on saying like positive impact or swapping with learning game. So uh, when I say like positive impact game, what I really mean is a game that has a purpose that once someone has played it and it has had some kind of change in effect to that person, like a, something I learned or a perspective that they've taken, that some kind of absorption of, of practice or identity or systems is uh something that they can take with them and, and transfer into the rest of their world. So they've generated some type of perspective or knowledge of value that they can use elsewhere is kind of like the, the, the simplest sort of summary of, of the field. So most of the time, well, actually I think all the time when Filma takes a project, we have to sort of work with our prospective clients to craft sort of an impact mission statement of like, what do we want people to know or be able to do or be able to say, or, uh or think about and then we can't let go of that no matter what like the game has to incorporate that um so this is a little picture of a, a game we make called beats empire uh it's a game about data visualization and in it you like run a studio a music studio in new york city and you're trying to research you know uh user data of what what people are into and sort of cultivate artists and release records that will be the biggest sellers possible. I mean, that's still a cool idea for a game, right? It, it feels great. Um, but what we absolutely had to have was a set of really robust data visualization tools and let people experiment with data visualization to be able to make strategic savvy decisions. Because that was the positive impact goal was to have uh, players understand that they can use tools to visualize data to make better decisions and learning more about the shape and nature of data visualization tools was the actual objective. So this game could have been about, uh, you know, from our perspective, it could have pivoted to, I don't know, arranging like adventuring parties to go defeat dragons or, uh, I don't know, maybe you're, maybe you're building a stock portfolio, whatever it is, right? Like, so we settled in on something that you thought was an engaging theme, but the theme had to serve the content rather than the, the theme having to serve engagement. Um, and that happens over and over in our projects. And that's, uh, it's a challenge. It's really unique and interesting challenge. It's like why I really like the field I'm in, but uh, I think that's the biggest, most fundamental difference. Uh, entertainment games can throw away a different set of things than we can while designing their game for maximum outcomes. Um, some important caveats. So uh, positive impact games can still kind of uh, still have to lie to players. Uh, so uh, once you've picked your learning objectives, et cetera, there's still going to be methods of abstraction or simplification, or in some cases, that's just not how it actually works that you will employ to better illustrate that idea. And 
I, I know it sounds naughty, but you know, it, it's used all the time all over the place to teach content. So the most classic example is, you know, when you think of like the the 1950s like drawing of an atom, right? Like the, the classic atomical structure, atomic structure. Like atoms don't look like that. They don't look anything like that at all. But it is a really nice, concise visualization of the components of an atom that makes sense to people they can think about and use. So the lie helps reveal a greater truth. And inside games, we have a lot of the same types of decisions. So I have a quick picture here of an older game that we made here at Filament called Reach for the Sun. In this game, you uh, you pick a, a plant and you have basically a year to try and grow it and fruit before winter takes over. Um, and during that, you make strategic decisions about what parts of the plant to build. So you might build roots or build more leaves. You have to decide like when to flower. Uh, so it's kind of got you know some shoot the moon type strategy things about how much do you invest in infrastructure before you switch over to production. Um, and the player has to make those decisions strategically. So plants obviously don't make those decisions strategically. Uh, and, uh, and that's not how it works. So in theory, a player could play this game and think that each plant is sitting there just pondering its next tactical move. Um, but that's that's not how it works. But in order, our real goal was to get people to think about plant anatomy and function. Um, and we felt that this this change to the model of how plants work was worth it because it gives the player a tactical, strategic way to conceptualize the pieces of a plant, which makes it you know a much more transferable, effective idea. Um, a similar sort of misnomer that happen happens like. I don't know if people remember Spore from uh, Will Wright, a classic sort of macro evolutionary game uh, where you go from like a single cell organism up to space travel. Um, and I've definitely heard people be like, oh, what a neat game to like teach evolution. But you make, you know, active decisions about each adaptation that you want to develop your creature for along the way. So if anything, it's a if it's an educational game, it's an educational game about intelligent design, not evolution. Uh, but uh, and so it's uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. So you could say that a game like Spore teaches interesting ideas about how what are types of adaptations for creatures. But if you were if your goal when you made Spore, which it wasn't their goal, but if your goal was to make a game about evolution and you made Spore, you would have done a really dangerous thing and actually imparted the exact wrong lessons for, for how adaptation works. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, I've got another caveat. <laughs> so uh, we also have to like, we do have to make some concessions between engagement and authenticity. Uh, I once gave a like wildly unpopular talk about how like I was sick of fun um, because I'm I'm very interested in authenticity to content. And I have the opinion as a designer that uh, if we're making a game about a thing and you genuinely are not interested and don't like that thing, I don't think it's the, I would rather have our game authentically maintain your level of antipathy than then lie to you about the thing so much that you think you would like it. Uh, uh, no one liked that talk because it was like pre-admitting defeat on a project that didn't exist, but I still think it's basically true. But we are looking for uh, looking for ways to make sure that the game has effective scaffolding. It presents a problem in the right order. And we're looking for ways to pick off the biggest wins that align with engagement inside a learning objective. Um, so it does matter. Obviously, if the game is terrible, even if it's authentic content, uh, there's not much you can do. So I'm going to bring up Guitar Hero here because it's another a commercial game, but it definitely got a lot of interest in learning and research circles back when it was, you know, the bee's knees. Um, and people were like, is this game teaching you guitar? Uh, are you, and in some ways the answer is yes, right? I think if you approached guitar playing from like an identity perspective, 
like Guitar Hero imparts the sense of you being connected with a, a band playing live music. You're rhythmically connected to it. You're even doing stuff with your fingers and in some sense tracking music and you feel like you could be great at guitar. So uh, I, there's, there, there are tons of people who I'm, I'm positive, I think there's been research for this, that started with a guitar hero and then wanted to move on to play actual guitar because they, they really enjoyed that sense of identity that the game imparted. Um, but uh, I don't know if anyone here plays guitar or, or N has played guitar hero, but guitar hero definitely skips all the things that are unfun about learning guitar. Uh, the, the finger positioning and chords uh, that, and uh, yeah, all the things that are actually hard. Guitar Hero is sanded off to get you straight to the sensation of, you know, meatily meeting across a six solo and feeling great about it. Um, and uh, if you uh, take the time to learn real guitar, you'll realize that real guitar isn't anywhere near smoothly scaffolded, right? There's actually huge plateaus where you're just doing chord progression practice over and over and over until your fingers don't think about it anymore. Uh, and it's not fun, it's not rewarding. You don't feel like you're getting better until you can move on. Um, and you know, Guitar Hero figures out how to basically skip those things and let you still feel like you've got a contiguous progression. Um, so it's a fair, it's a fair version. You, I can imagine a learning game studio inventing Guitar Hero and deciding it was a successful learning game because it does impart a ton of identity goals for getting people to be excited about the idea of being a guitar player. And it gives you some aspects of guitar practice in a, in a very specific way, but it definitely skips and lies about a bunch of them. Um, I, I definitely know that there were like, you know, sort of spin-off projects from other companies where they're like, well, can we hook up a real guitar and give you a similar note scaffolding system? Um, obviously rock band was a thing that started expanding into more instruments and the drum set with that was, you know, the drums are way more drummy than, than the guitar is guitar-y. So authenticity and practice are things that started bleeding into the genre after Guitar Hero happened. Um, and it was cool. So I can see, uh, I can see a game like Guitar Hero being made as a serious game and considering itself a success, but it would have some big caveats about, well, this is what we're teaching and this is what we're not teaching. In fact, in some senses, you might say, these are things that we'll have to unteach you later uh, if you really want to keep going with guitar. Um, okay, so uh, over to the other side of the shop, rather than design, uh, the business model that drives serious games and is just a totally wildly different model. Like it has almost nothing to do with either the AAA or indie game components of, uh, of, uh, of the industry. Um, and in some ways, this makes me feel like we're not even in the same industry. Uh, so, and again, this is not my expertise, so I may be simplifying things in an unfortunate way, but so if you're a studio that works for large AAA games or publishers, uh, generally you're put onto a project that you know may have hundreds of developers working for multiple years, sometimes often many, many studios, sometimes across the globe. Uh, your job as an individual on that game may be you know, something like, I place lights. And that is the extent of you know, the, the breadth of your contribution to the model. Uh, and so it's just an entirely different way of thinking about making games. And the risks are all built up totally differently, right? Like it's not uncommon for uh, a AAA independent studio if it can't find the next publisher funded game like it will do massive layoffs and go semi-dormant until the next gig so uh or if you're a uh if you're a studio that has been purchased by a publisher right you've kind of got uh your your layout in front of you is pretty clear but you may be turned into a cylinder working on you know 
simply like level packs or other things until the next larger opportunity is shaped and come along for you. So you'll still have a sort of similar up and down. Um, indie games, right, obviously range from games that get funded in the tens of thousands of dollars to maybe some low hundreds maybe, or sometimes zero funds, just the old classic sweat equity model where maybe you are one or three people working at home and making a game on the side for no actual dollars incoming to do it. Um, and, you know, those are generally projects that won't succeed, but occasionally you get something like a, we got like zombies or, or I'm sorry, vampire survivors here in the middle as a, uh, uh, a, a new, a new darling in the, in the world. Uh, and it's very charming and uh and you know i'm, I'm sure they're gonna do great uh but uh it's a sort of different risk model than rather than you know throw all the money into it and then have your company evaporate if there's not another next thing indie game studios can often burn long with almost no resources trying to generate that next lottery ticket for the game that winds up catching off catching catching on rather um yeah, whereas, yeah, so Filament and I think other studios in our field are just, it's just none of, none of that matters to us. Like, <laughs> like we're uh, work for hire shop. Like, so clients come to us. Sometimes they're research organizations. Sometimes they're commercial organizations. Uh, sometimes they're not for profits. Um, and they have a, 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 a reason that they want to incorporate game-based learning or positive impact gaming into their mission and strategy. Uh, sometimes they're a startup and they see the game as like a tentpole for their fundamental business plan. Sometimes they, they might be like an educational company and they want to add games to a piece of hardware or maybe a partner to a curriculum. But whatever it is, like it's a it's just a totally different size thing on, you know, the average filament project gets measured in, you know, the lower hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, sometimes it'll Sometimes it'll be post a million. Uh, it's never 10 million. Uh, it's never a hundred million. Uh, and, you know, filament sort of arranged, I, I sort of think of it as like a, by team composition, we're kind of reassembling swarms of indie teams over and over. Like we usually have roughly monodiscipline teams. They'll be like a designer, a programmer, a UX person. Uh, and they kind of work as a assembled temporary small team uh, to complete that project. Um, and those projects are are developed in an in a iterative way. We use a lot of agile methodology, but we also have a fixed schedule and timeline. So we move through a waterfall alpha beta goal schedule to complete those games. Um, so, Sometimes, especially in like AAA, right? You know, it's not uncommon for a game to get delayed six months to a year or more. And you know, those are those are entire cycles of development inside filament. We would we would just make an entire another entire game in that time. Um, so the success of our model is based on you know generally having a large collection of multiple projects and in, in, in at once, which creates stability through quantity. Um, and then usually we're working on maybe one or two sort of bigger experiences are kind of like anchoring the studio, but it makes us pretty resilient, right? We have a, we have a lot of, I were really lucky to be able to work with a lot of different people making a lot of different things. Um, so we don't have that risk of AAA of having everything tied to one mega project. But we're also funded, so we don't have the risks of indie games of just having to work and subsist on ramen and wonder about how rent gets paid. Uh, so I, I think it's a pretty cool niche. Uh, it means that we usually have a pretty sustainable uh, staff cycle. You know, uh, we're not, we're not. Well, I guess you know the entire game industry is getting a, is getting better about not being a hellish overtime place to be. Um, but we've like never really been that. It's always been pretty sustainable, positive work. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's it's just a different animal. It does mean that uh, uh, for salaries, like we're, we struggle uh, as a 
as sort of in between studio. We can definitely pay better than an India studio, but AAA studios usually have you know salaries that are hard for us to compete with. But and we can offer things like, hey, you don't have to sleep under your desk back when having desks was a thing, uh, or uh, we don't have a massive layoff planned at the end of a project. Um, but you know, those are sort of slightly harder to quantify than the literal take home. So, so we're, yeah, we're just like in a little interesting nook. And I, and I, I guess a lot of the similar studios that are client-based are kind of in the same shape, um, but it just makes everything, everything different uh, in terms of where money comes from and how we spend it and how the company survives and grows is, is just a, an entirely different thing. Um, this one is a uh, constantly happens uh, when people think about the promise of of game based learning. They think about the passion that people have for games, and maybe that's even their own personal passion. They'll be like, "I freaking love games. I will, I will, you know, I will sit down and play this game for 12, 14 hours. What if I did that for physics? Uh, right? And this is an awesome, noble sentiment." Um, but there's a huge assumption that is in the middle of that that often gets overlooked. When I use Slay the Spire here because I think it's a game that uh, people love and will play a 12-hour sitting of, or play it for you know months and months and months to like mine out every aspect of strategy. So you can think about the passion and play time duration and depth that a game like Slay the Spire issues, and you think about the people who love playing it. But you have to remember that those people bought that game. <laughs> They're playing that game on purpose because they want to play card-based roguelike strategy games. Um, they don't, uh, they may never, ever, ever want to play a real-time strategy game or a first-person shooter or anything else. Uh, uh, they have self-selected themselves into the passion of that of that game by genre, or whatever else, whatever whatever else it is. Serious games almost never have that luxury. Usually, when you're making a serious game, you're designing it for an audience that isn't pre-selected at all based on a genre preference. In fact, sometimes you're designing it as an antithesis to content preference you might be you might be making a game being like we have a really hard time teaching this thing because people really don't enjoy learning it so let us make a game about it and again like my point above if that game is a positively Im impact game that's built seriously around that content that same type of frustration and barriers for that content isn't going away just because it's a game so uh, yeah, and also sometimes you're making games for people who don't like games. Like if you're making a game for a classroom, uh, yeah, there's there's going to be some kids in there that are hardcore gamers, and there's going to be most of those kids will play games of some sort, maybe largely social or simpler games, uh, mobile, etc. Um, but there is there's absolutely no guarantee that those players are would ever pick up a game that's similar to yours voluntarily and get into it. Uh, just because it is game uh, doesn't necessarily mean it is universally appealing. Uh, another sort of interesting way to think about it is like, you know, lots of people like movies, uh, but if you make a movie about different types of dirt, um, you're not gonna expect that to succeed because it's a movie and people like movies, right? It's still about dirt. So you've still got a whole rack of problems in front of you. So choosing game is not necessarily an instant uh, panacea, like, aha, now they will love it. Uh, you still have a long way to go uh, to make sure that the game is actually going to cater to and serve the audience you're making it for. And that's tricky business. Uh, I think, yeah, one more note about that, especially in terms of an audience that isn't necessarily into games, is that you know, good games do a great job scaffolding you through how those games work. Um, but almost always they can rely on some form of genre literacy and entertainment, right? Like if you're making a first person shooter, you can probably spend, you know, 10 seconds being like, you know, WASD moves you around, you're, you know, move, you move your head with your mouse. You did it. 
right? But if that game is being put into a classroom, uh, I would say, you know, somewhere between the half or even the majority of those kids have no experience with first person shooting controls. And it is in fact a very hard skill to learn. So you've put a large literacy barrier between you and your audience just right out of the gate. Then you're gonna have to teach them how to how to how to move like that. Uh, if you're gonna have them experience the game like that. Because you can't rely on genre literacy. And that's tricky. Um, yeah, so I mean that's kind of those are kind of my big points uh the things that i think are kind of like the biggest distinctions of the field uh it's obviously not deeply comprehensive these are just kind of the highlights from the design and business model side but like i said i've been making a ridiculous amount of games in this field for what seems like a surreal amount of time so i'm happy to be a resource and answer any other questions you've got about about our neck of the woods Uh, thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. So um, we have quite a few folks with us. Um, so I guess we can do a, either throw it in the chat or a hands up if you want to talk um, for Q and A. Uh, I have several questions, but I'm going to try to hold off and see what else everybody else has. Nathan has a question. Nathan is um, teaches teaches here for us, and he also um, is now well. He was teaching a lot more. Now he's now he's off in the game industry. But he says, you probably can't say anything about this, but it's worth a shot. I've been watching the status of Roboco, Roboco since I lost the chance to play it. Oh, yeah. And, and Nathan, feel free to turn your mic on. You, you, you uh, Games for a Change in 2017. Last update to your FAQ is that it's coming for early access in 2021. Yeah. Oh, boy. That's an exciting question. Yeah, Roboco. Uh, so first thing. Um, email here. I'm going to type. I'm going to type their name here into chat. Uh, this is Brandon Pitzer, who helped set this up actually, but uh, also is kind of our head liaison for Roboco stuff. Oh, there he is! I didn't know you're here, Brandon. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, get a hold of Brandon. Uh, I, Brandon, was it you and I that were at? Games for Change 2017 showing off Roboco? Was that the year that we were doing it? Maybe? I don't know. But whatever the case I'm is. I'm not sure. Am I, am I on? Okay, I'm not on mute. Cool. Um, yeah, I think I was definitely there in their um, their arcade area up at the yeah. top. And we were showing a very early VR first version of it. Actually, that was that predated the PC edition of it. Yeah, that's, yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Bug, uh, send Brandon a message, and uh, I don't know where we are in terms of our cycle of sharing builds. Um, yeah, I, I know. I'm sorry, I missed the start of that question. Was it? There's an FAQ that's saying something about 2021. Yeah, yep. I actually, you know, I I check back on your website every once in a while just to see what the status is, and the current status is the FAQ says um, it should be coming for early access in 2021. That's on. Uh, on this page. Yeah, we did have a limited, very limited Steam build put up on in last year. But yeah, we're still, we're in the thick of development. It's going awesome. Yes. Um, I uh, see all your videos and they all look amazing. It looks yeah, so fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank it's you. exciting yeah, so, stuff. So clearly the FAQ is a lie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I think so the, the latest update on that um, is we're looking at probably later this year for an actual early access, like wide release to everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, I can I, I feel comfortable saying that that's kind of our official stance right now. I am budgeting for that. <laughs> so um, nice. so, yeah, that'll be the next step. Um, and yeah, keep it locked at the Roboco.co website to uh, yeah. stay apprised of all that. Yeah. And I can also say, too, that the delays are are that definitely like awesome news rather than like development hell we've been pulling in new partners and our our funding for the project has has increased so we've been adding ambition to the timeline and project so uh it's yeah it's very exciting so uh it's yeah coming soon is, is this a serious game 
Yeah, so um, it started as a actually a grant proposal that Filament made to do a VR game about STEM engineering uh, and VR. Uh, it's a game that we've been working on, yeah, for a long time now about uh, at this point and now pretty much locked is uh, it's a robot design and engineering game where you build robots to complete tasks for for whimsical humans in kind of a uh, experimental lab space. Uh, it's I kind of think of it as like a fusion between scrap mechanic and untitled goose game is a maybe like the, the the spiritual alignment of it. Yes, and everyone loves the wobbly humans. I love the wobbly humans. Uh, so yeah, there's a set of missions inside it that have a set of you know generally pretty whimsical goals. Uh, and you have to sort of build robots to be able to accomplish all those tasks. That's got an extremely robust robot design and construction system. Uh, yeah, and we're building it across PC and VR, and uh, we've got some, yeah, there's just some, um, yeah, it's super exciting. The studio has been really behind it, and we just, yeah, keep on making stuff for it. So it's, it's going great. Um, so far, there's no other questions in the chat, so I'm going to take one real quick. Um, Do it. Since 2017, that's when I first taught a VR class. Um, had, had, in the serious game industry, I kind of ex I'm kind of wondering, like, are there more projects coming? Like the percentage of projects that are VR or AR related, is that increasing or is that still stable or low? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. Um, I think the main barrier, right, is still if you're making a game to reach an audience, right? If, because you have a positive impact goal, your first question is, does that audience have uniformly, uniform access to VR devices? And, you know, almost always the answer is nope, 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 nope. Uh, so uh, it's almost, Roboco is actually kind of, I think the, the a better version of that play where we can make a game with a real positive impact, but then we're reaching out specifically like the VR component is uh, that the VR market, I believe, is a market that's really interested in new experiences in VR. Like, can I do something in VR that I haven't done before? So offering a really robust robot construction system in VR, I think, is a really great outreach idea but for most of our work at filament uh it generally isn't a commercial first play like that where the audience could be sorted based on on market and is really more you're trying to reach a particular group of people to teach a particular thing and then when you line that up with the venn diagram of who's got vr uh it's generally not a great wedge. So there definitely have been VR projects inside Filament and we do them and we love them, but uh, it's still it's still too early to say, I need to make a game about X for these types of kids. VR is the answer. Uh, in fact, I think it might've have, it might have been honestly more likely back when they kind of had Google Cardboard, et cetera, was sort of out there as, being pushed and supported, uh, you know, but, you know, now we're shifting into like good news where everyone's looking more seriously at, at more higher fidelity VR tools, but they're still very far from being in the hands of the average user. Thanks. Um, we have a question from one of our faculty here, Professor Ted Prowett. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, hey, uh, Dan, nice to meet you. Um, so yeah. I've been a serious game designer for about 15 years and, and followed your um, your company very closely. Um, I'm currently working on a game to teach middle school students about um, STEM related to Titanic. You go inside the boiler. Oh, cool. Um, so one of the, yeah, maybe talk sometime. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me, and I think that you've really worked hard to solve that dilemma, is the, the connection between the pedagogical content knowledge or the content mm -hmm. and the, the gameplay. So that's kind of where like I can show the boiler room, I can take them in, they can see a cross section of the boiler. But then my question is like, where do you go from there? Like, how do you think through that process when you're designing a serious game? Because it's a, it's a completely different, you know, um, set of, of ideas 
you know, so I'm kind of intrigued. Uh, oh, sure. Your brain even. Yeah. This is a great question. Uh, this, I've thought about this. <laughs> uh, so uh, Philbin actually has a pretty reliable kind of, uh, I, I, I call it like the three gates and our methodology is pretty, pretty straightforward actually. So step one at Philbin is identify learning objectives. What is it you want to teach? What is it you want someone to know? Step two, identify assessments like uh, or if assessment is too spooky of a word because it sounds too much like quizzes, be like, a, identify measurements. How would you like to measure uh, the, whether or not you've had the impact that you want? Once you've done that, we basically use three different strategies to migrate those objectives slash assessments into gameplay. Um, and I'll go through them pretty quickly. So the first is verbs, right? So in games, you do stuff. Uh, and if your learning objectives are about doing something, if you want someone to be able to do something that they couldn't do before, and then you, you can ask yourself, can I make a digital version of that action that makes sense? Is it, is it portable to a digital experience to be able to do that thing? And if that's true, then you've got a really straightforward conduit of saying, aha, okay, I will scaffold, offer reward structures and complexify that action over the course of the game. And now you've got an engine that'll drive the entire game. So you give players an interesting verb of something they can do and how to get better at it and how to make it more complex. And it's tied to your objectives. Uh, thing two, uh, so if it's not verbs, it might be identity, right? So uh, games can do a lot of things, but one of the most unique things that games have is the ability to impart sort of a merged identity where the game can say, you are this person, you're also you, but you're also this person, right? And it's in, even in commercial games, a commercial game can say things like, you're a lawyer now, uh, you're a cook, you're a car thief, you're a dragon slayer, you're a drug dealer, you're uh, a floating god-like entity that can control the civilization, whatever it is, right? The game just says, you're, you're this, and players say, okay. And uh, so if your objectives are about understanding a perspective, about trying to understand maybe a professional practice as a, as a, a job that has a particular perspective or whatever it is, if identity is a core part of your objectives, you can place the player in that identity, get them to understand that perspective and those con constraints, and now you've got an engine for how to make the game work. Um, the last one is systems. So games are, in, especially from like a design reductionist perspective, like games are made out of rules and players are asked to inhabit and master those rules in order to be good at the game. So if your learning objective is about some type of ecology or ecosystem or, or uh, anything that has complex inputs and outputs with unexpected outcomes, and you want players to, or you want your learners to understand those things, you can shape the game's actual inhabited world along that same system, ask people to inhabit and master it, and they'll come outside once they leave the game, they'll have had an extremely robust dynamic understanding of how that system works. Um, so lots of games we make will be a blend of all three, or maybe it goes hard on one, uh, so it's kind of like we look at all three strategies and figure out how to do it, but we just do that like over and over and over and over. So I guess for your case, um, it's almost kind of interesting when you do history games, uh, a lot of the time, the first instinct is, aha, we will make the game place you into that moment in history, right? And that... That makes a bunch of sense and is in fact a totally valid strategy from the identity perspective. If you're like, I would love someone to understand this content from the perspective of someone who lived in it. And it might even be systems, right? Like if you wanna make a game about like the collapse of the robot empire, give someone like a logistics management problem inside how to maintain like a, a failing colony on the German border or something like that. Right, then you've got a then you've got a another angle. But a lot of the time, if you look at your learning objective uh, maps and history, a lot of it is sometimes like, well, what is the actually 
the practice of the historian rather than what is the practice of a person in the past, right? So looking at documents, considering sources, you know, uh, constructing multiple perspectives, uh, sifting through evidence, those are all like verbs. Those are all now things that you can ask people to perform as historical practices that can be gameplay tools. Uh, and, you know, like a quick shortcut and that was like, you know, something like, uh, uh, let's see, Phoenix Law East Attorney, not that far away from trying to make some type of historical game. So rather than evidence to like figure out who stole the diamonds, you can be like, how can you assemble source materials and make an argument about something that happened in the past? So, so you can look at historical practice as your origin for verbs. And at least based on how you describe your project, that might be the way I'd go being like, how can the player analyze the wreck of the Titanic and put together solve a historical mystery and what are the what does it mean to analyze right i can't you know beyond just oh i found the i found the goblet on the ground but like what uh trying to you know what is stuff that's actually from the wreck or what are things that are introduced later or you know like yeah putting in historical practice into the investigation of the wreck would be the route i would go thank you so much yeah yeah, I love the showing of the three gates. I just have to ask, is that something filament or is that something I should know from? That is, a, that is a filamenty thing. Oh, it does okay. have a catchy title. So yeah, it sounds like a thing. But yeah, the yeah. three, the three gates. I think I just I use it over and over. Things. It's like, yeah, it doesn't get it doesn't uh <laughs> doesn't get a never is useless. So yeah. Almost everything fits into into that somehow. Yeah, not... I'm really big on uh uh, I really like uh, tools like that that are, it's just useful, right? Like you can you can argue about whether there needs to be a fourth tool or maybe one of those tools is actually six tools if you, but it's like, you know, it's, the, it's like a tool drawer. You can grab one of the three and apply the wrench and see if it works and it gets you yeah. there. So, yeah. Um, Robbie has a hand up. Robbie Dietrich is also a faculty at GMU. Welcome. There we go. There's the unmute. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. Uh, so the question I'd like to ask is, uh, have you ever, do you ever find yourself running into sort of constraints as far as the sort of like aesthetic choices you could make, make for your games? You know, does it ever frustrate you? Um, and I hmm. sort of mean less from like a sort of a technical, like budgetary level, but more from just sort of the, what is acceptable to your, to your audience? You know, are there cases where you might have like, oh, well, this is going to be targeted for older folks in HR or something like that. And because of that, we actually want to avoid like cutesy stuff because their generation is like hates comics, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. something of that sort. Yes. Uh, so first off, uh, well, actually, zero off. Does that turtles uh, cabinet work? Oh, he not... It used to, but, but this is one of the arcade retro one-ups, but I've, uh, I'm putting in new insights for it so we can, so I can run student games on it. So oh, that's, that's awesome. The, it's the target machine for uh, my 400 level class. They, they okay. built stuff for that. Awesome. Okay. Sorry. Just uh, no, no problem. Desk. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, yes, we do have those challenges. I think a very common one is uh, we'll hit, especially like middle school or high school and our clients will have a lot of anxiety about making something that's whimsical because like, you know, those kids are, the theory is that they're very adamant about wanting to be treated like adults. So yeah. everything needs to be brushed metal and just, I, yeah. And it drives me nuts because I, at least for me, I'm like, but Pokemon exists. I think everybody should be up for cute. I don't understand. I don't understand the anti-cute brigade, of, uh, but yeah. So with adult, adult audiences, uh, uh, I think it's actually more, we're more wary about the level of fantasy or fictionalization, like, uh, or making it very gamey, but we're still, at least Filament always tries to advocate for, we like beautiful art. Uh, uh, we're not, a, we're not afraid of something being charming and whimsical and we'll advocate for it. And if someone wants to be, uh, someone wants or needs 
brushed metal with sonar beeps and stuff to like make the sciencey science. Uh, I, I, we fight it and we try and we try and push for the accessible for everybody and get rid of the alienatingly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, we do have that problem. It does happen. We do fight it. I think we usually win. Uh, or or you know, it's also you can be kind of insidious about it. You just have to like not give up and just keep on keep on going for slightly more charming until they stop calling you out on it. Cute. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, actually, just a quick little follow-up. Could I ask you to repeat the three gates? Oh, know, sure. Yeah. For some of my students, that might be a question on the quiz that's following up on this. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So it's uh, verbs. So the things you do in the game. Identity. Who are you in the game? And system. How does the game work? Yay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've got notes on those, Robbie, if you need them. <laughs> Um, so are there any other questions? I'm not, I'm looking at the chat and no hands up currently. Otherwise I'm going to ask another, we still have about five more minutes. Yeah. The, the article that was kind of, um, I thought was revolutionary because when I first started that Titanic project, it was what if a teacher could take, you know, students and have a class there. But one of the things that, um, I saw recently on your blog was this idea of, um, I've, I'm drawing it. I got all these windows up um, about these, you know, kind of the immersive learning space. And I mean, it was connected to VR and um, the metaverse. But I was thinking, um, you know, how do you envision that really maybe changing a classroom environment, you know, going forward? I mean, because serious games is just whereas I felt like 10 years ago, like in two years, serious games will be nothing. It just got to keep sustaining. But it just seems like it's set to kind of grow. So as a field anyway. Yeah. Um, so the VR, just virtual spaces and like, yeah, with uh, the arguably grim cyberpunk future of metaverse. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I am not, I'm not actually a great futurist. I, I feel like, uh, at least from my perspective, um, when I think about making games about in VR, or even, even stepping back one, just being like 3D spaces for games. I really kind of think about like, well, what do those things gain me as advantages, right? So, and VR actually has a unique set of advantages different than other games. In fact, it's almost another genre. It's almost not quite game making anymore. Um, like a quick example is that I, inside film, we found that UX, the user experience uh, department at Filament rises in power and responsibility on our VR projects because so much of whether or not a VR experience is going to be engaging is whether or not the map to the human waving the their virtual mittens around makes sense. All right. And that's that's such a gigantic component that the game designer is is along for the ride on the, some of that stuff. Right. So we have a, a shift of a shift of creative responsibility is just try to make the VR work as a genre. Um, but a lot of the time, again, I would just go back to my objectives and be like, do is what I want to teach more effective because it's put into a virtual environment? Does that gain me an affordance? Um, something like the Titanic has an obvious great VR mapped affordance because one of the things that VR can do better than anything else is a sense of scale. Like if you stand next to, if you see a picture of an elephant, you'll be like, oh, look at that, an elephant. Stand next to an elephant in VR and holy crap, Elephants are big, uh, and no other medium actually can sell you on a sense of proportion and scale and and placeness being there. So the core premise of Get to the Titanic is, is an awesome one because it really will have a really visceral impact of uh, no one, like I literally will never forget when I stood next to an elephant in VR. I, you know, it, it, it burned into Same. my brain, right? You know, some, yeah. some part of my brain's like, whoa, they're really big. Yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. It's on my list. And same yeah. with the Titanic. You'd be like, holy cow, there it is. Yeah. So, it's like looking uh, at the funnels. I, I was in VR and I, I just, for, you know, looking at the funnels actually went up in space. That was like incredible. Like, you know, yeah, that was kind of an incredible experience. So you're right. Yeah. I, I would that. say like the grim dark alternative and this is something that I've way back when when I worked at that like online learning research center one of the projects was like let's recreate virtual classrooms in second life because you know that was a thing 
that still is a thing but uh and so the idea is that kids would take their avatars and sit at desks and then the teacher would control their avatar at the front of a blackboard and they would have entirely the same experience as a regular same classroom old, same old. yeah but now you're looking at a screen that's looking at a blackboard that's like a you know something like a fifth of your screen it at a weird angle so now you can't even read it like so nothing has been gained so much has been lost everything is worse uh but you can have fox ears i guess so it's okay uh so i definitely am not interested in I don't think anyone should be interested in virtual spaces as replacement of physical space because in because we already have physical space uh use vr specifically to create experiences that you couldn't accomplish in physical space and create experiences that actually use the benefits of the tools making making a super boring class in vr is going to be just as boring except now you've got eye strain on top of it that's why I'm not a futurist. I'm too cranky. <laughs> so oh, I'm sorry. There, yeah, yeah. There may be a couple follow-up questions, um, but I want to um, give you the opportunity to um, end the session because um, we have a lot of students here, and they could probably talk your ear off. Uh, but it is one o'clock. So this is normally when we end. Um, I so can, I'm happy to wrap up the questions we've got going here. That would be fun. Okay, great. Um, but for anybody else who has to take off um, for, for a class or whatever, thank you all for coming and stick around if you have more questions or you just want to hear some more chatter. Um, and we will um, be posting this on the VSGI website. So if you want to watch the recording in the future, you can. And there are, and, and I think um, Riza already put that in the chat. Um, maybe you could drop it in there again, that website. And there you can see who the future speakers are. Um, I'm not going to um, talk about them right now like I usually do because I don't want to um, derail the conversation. So thanks again, Dan. And um, I think the next person who had a question, unless it was already answered, was Michael. Uh, was there a hand raised in there somewhere too? The... That, that was me. Um, okay. I have forgotten my question, actually. So there's that. Was Thank it the same for your question? Is... It was a wonderful little talk here. Yeah. It may have been the same question that Tony asked in the chat, which I think Brandon answered. Um, yeah. So are there any other questions then? Well, it looks like there was a question about how do people with grants and stuff know how to come to Filament? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, and it is, uh, I don't have a super handy answer. We've just been really lucky to be we got started in the field at a time when it was the iron was really hot. So we just had opportunities based on the field getting, I mean, they've been learning games for a long time, but the field was kind of reborn around then. Uh, and so at this point, largely filament doesn't do a lot of hunting for projects. People have seen our work, they see our portfolio online and they send us messages and then we figure out how to work together. I I acknowledge that that is a tremendously privileged answer. <laughs> I just sit here and projects show up. Uh, but yeah, I think we've got to really, I guess if I had advice, uh, a strong online portfolio. Uh, and uh, Filament got started on a project that was a consulting project that was... Uh, we, it was not dev. So we just worked with folks who wanted to ask us questions as some kids who knew about games and learning. And that turned into dev. And then we were working on our own projects. And so we kind of turned the crank ourselves. But originally, our, our goals were just to start the conversations with, with folks about how to start making stuff that could matter. Um, so uh, I think maybe look across your university and your professors and find out if there's, there's opportunities to provide dev and design and just get some projects going and, and, and put in, show up to, well, once, once conferences are a thing again, I bet you GLS is gonna be great. Uh, you know, show up and uh, see if you can get, it, get involved. And I'm sorry, it's a, not a great answer. We were, we were very lucky uh we're very fortunate to wind up having 
a business plan of like, just keep trying actually worked. And I, I acknowledge that doesn't always work. Um, so I, I was brought up in the chat, but I'll just reiterate um, that Robbie, who's with us, will be the next VSGI speaker um, on creating home uh, retro homebrew games. And he will be speaking on the 23rd, February 23rd. But Dan, I had one more question that I think I want to ask. Um, sure. Just because I think a lot of our students will be interested in this. Um, and also, I, in a previous talk with one of your colleagues at Philamont, they, they mentioned how they hire, um, you know, entry level, um, sometimes recent graduates. And, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, can you speak to our students to say, like, what would you be looking for? And, you know, and do you like hire, um, I think, maybe during COVID, but just in general, do, do you have virtual positions or contract for hire sometimes? We do. Like, how does that work? We do uh, just about all those things. So yeah, prior to the apocalypse, we were really kind of, or we were willing to work with remote people with the idea that if we were hiring them full time, they'd kind of find their way to Madison sooner or later. Uh, we pretty much now at this point, we're entirely open to that idea of permanent remote. Like filaments had longstanding, like pretty flexible work policies. So with COVID, it didn't actually rock the boat too much, but that did that is one thing we changed. So we're totally cool with the idea of permanent remote. Uh, you 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 gain some things and you lose some things, uh, but it's uh, it is now entirely a part of the filament fabric. And yeah, I think uh, design, programming, UX, uh, all those positions, uh, they're not necessarily all always open at any time, but. Uh, it's not at all uncommon for us to be cool with the idea of bringing in uh, someone who's just starting their career at that point. Uh, and like I said, we're in a really weird niche in the industry, right? So uh, uh, we're somewhere in between indie and and big, uh, closer to indie. But uh, if you're looking into getting into the games industry at large, we're I'm comfortable with the idea of saying like, we're a pretty cool stepping stone. Like you can get a lot of real games industry experience making real games. Uh, and maybe your goals are to, well, don't go to Riot, but I don't know. Maybe you want to go make bigger stuff afterwards. We're a pretty cool place to get, get your chops done. And sometimes that's people's plan and then they stick around anyway because it's just a pretty good time. But yeah, so... I mean, you know, I've never been to Riot. I, one of our one of our producers went to Riot and had, uh, uh, I would say, they had a great experience or anything. But they did get to make some very cool stuff. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, probably don't go to Riot. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. All right. So, are there any other questions for Dan? Dan, thank you again. I think we can go ahead and stop the recording. Whoever is controlling that. Um, thank you again. And I'll